Hi, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. Today's December 4th, 2019. So I'm really excited about this topic tonight because I think it's something that's that's fresh and new and different. I, I It comes from, it comes to me because I, I, in therapy, have been thinking about recently working with some, some young people about how the, this this idea that's become popular today to talk about gaslighting is not that far off from the way that we all often talk to each other. And oftentimes parents talk to children, especially when anger, sadness, or hurt is directed at the parent from the child. So it's really something I've been talking about for 20 years, but this, this new term or this term that's getting used more and more often kind of crystallizes the idea for me. So tonight's broadcast is gaslighting, parenting, and the narcissistic wound. I think there's some value tonight because I'm going to talk about some some phrases, some words that I, I don't think we all quite know the meaning of. So this was a post that I posted about a week ago or so after a, a session I'd had with some young people, with a, with a young person. Uh, I, I posted this on my social media, on my Twitter account. Most parents gaslight their children on a consistent basis. Regretfully, I have done it more than I would like to admit. And yes, it is a symptom of the parent, of parental narcissism. And then I went on to say later that it, it's this very experience as children uh, of being gaslit that makes us susceptible to it later on in our life, right? If we are made to think that what we're feeling is crazy or wrong, something's wrong about us because of the way that we're feeling and that's a that's a something that happens to us chronically then that that's going to give us this a kind of vulnerability to it later on in our life so this is the starting point this, this tweet and this this post that i made and then i'm going to talk a little bit about kind of breaking it apart um let's talk about where the word where the term gaslighting comes from i didn't know this i hadn't heard of it until recently it gets used a lot more. I hadn't heard of it until the last few years. So the etymology of the word is the term originates in the systematic psychological manipulation of a victim by her husband in the 1938 stage play Gaslight. Later on, it was made to be a movie with a different title. In the story, a husband attempts to convince his wife and others that she is insane by manipulating small elements of their environment and insisting that she is mistaken, remem remembering things incorrectly or delusional when she points out these changes. The play's title alludes to how the abusive husband slowly dims the gaslights in their home while pretending nothing has changed. So this example, or at least where this word comes from, I, I think might be misleading in, in how we think about it today. This is, of course, a very conscious manipulation. And one of the things that happened when I posted this is I had lots of reactions to it. Perhaps my language was a little bit too strong to say most parents do it on a chronic basis. And some people responded that it was a very overt, conscious thing done by somebody to kind of psychologically torture another. But as is the case with virtually all symptoms in, in psychology and in therapy, everything is much more like a continuum than it is a binary, right? The, the idea of mental health and mental illness is not really a binary. There are there are kind of two pole opposites, and most of us are somewhere. All of us are somewhere in between those two pole opposites. So that's where the, where it comes from. A couple of def definitions that I pulled from a website and from Wikipedia, and they're they're essentially all the same. Are these two definitions of gaslighting? Gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation in which a person seeks to sow seeds of doubt in a targeted individual or or in members of a targeted group making them question their own memory, perception, and sanity. Using persistent denial, misdirection, contradiction, and lying, gaslighting involves attempts to destabilize the victim and delegitimize the victim's beliefs. Second definition, gaslighting abuse can be per perpetrated either by women or men. Withholding is one gaslighting technique where the abuser feigns a lack of understanding, refuses to listen, and declines to share his emotions. Gaslighting examples of this would be, I'm not listening to that crap again. And that's a phrase, for example, that I've heard parents respond to with children. I've responded to it in my marriage before. Not that I'm, I'm proud of that, but in moments when I'm feeling threatened, when I'm feeling inadequate, 
or insecure, I want to make the other person feel crazy, right? That, that's a psychological technique that, that, that demonstrates that I can't be the bad one. If you're upset with me, if you're angry, if you're hurt by something that I did, that threatens my sense that I'm good. That's the fundamental idea. So then I have to split that off of myself. I, I can't own the badness. The badness can't be inside me. And I make the badness in you. I make you the crazy one. The way that my therapist often has referred to this is I can't carry around in this example, I can't carry around my horrible rotten self. So I must make other people do it principally my children. So again, gaslighting can be thought uh, as of as an extreme manipulative, almost sadistic kind of thing, but it often can show up much more subtle than we, we imagine, much less overt, much less conscious. I pulled this slide, for those of you watching on the webinar version, I pulled this slide just to remind you that we've talked about this before, this idea. This slide, that what I'm going to read to you, comes from a presentation I did on attachment theory, and I, I, I separated the the idea of healthy attachment and non-healthy attachment or non-secure attachment into the their categories. So I'm going to read to you the list of, of somebody asked me actually some examples when I when I posted this. What are examples of this? And this is what I shared with them. What secure attachment sounds like? It's it's not this right. Secure attachment is much more fundamental and, and comprehensive than just the things that we say, but. If, if we were trying to operationalize it, trying to say this is what it sounds like when somebody is providing a, a secure attachment experience for a child, it sounds like this, these phrases. Thank you for telling me. Tell me more. I appreciate knowing. I'm glad that you told me. Thanks. That sounds hard. I'm sorry. I am here. I am listening. You're not alone. That makes sense. Is there anything that I can do? You must have a good reason. I'd like to understand. What can I do to help support you? And maybe even ultimately, I can relate. So if, if you want to take a screenshot of this or, or a picture of this with your camera, this is really a simple way to think about it. Are these the phrases that come out of your mouth when your child says, I'm mad at you. I'm angry that you won't let me go out. I'm angry that you won't let me date. I'm angry that you won't let me borrow the car, that you won't give me money for rent. And again, it's not these words, but it's the feelings beneath the words. It's the feelings under which these words would, would, would spring forth, right? They're just examples. Now, what's the opposite? Non-secure attachment. Here are some examples. That's silly. That's irrational. You're being unreasonable, stupid, ridiculous. Those are kind of extreme, right? You're overreacting. That's not too extreme. I probably got told that as a child hundreds of times by my mother. You're too sensitive. You're scaring me. Again, we, we might not put it in that category, but that that's an inability for the parent to contain the child, right? Too anxious, too scared to be able to contain the child. You're being selfish. I cannot tell you how many parents, and sometimes even therapeutic staff will slip into this, use the phrase selfish. You should, and then virtually anything that comes after that. Don't pay them any mind, they're just jealous. You're talking somebody out of their feelings. Ignore them. You'll get over it. Look on the bright side. Why did you do that? And if the, if the question is truly curious, like in the previous examples where I said things like I want to understand, that's different. But oftentimes, why did you do that does not mean why the, did you do that. It means you're being an idiot. You're being crazy or irrational. Have you tried this or that, right? You go right into fix mode. Dismissing, ignoring, implying that, that the person has not evolved. That's your depression, insecurity, anxiety, narcissism, defense, rationalization, justification. I put those in there because when you get a little bit of, of, of therapy, of psychology under your belt, 
you 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 weaponize it's easy to weaponize it i see therapists priding themselves i was talking to somebody recently about their experience of being trained in a treatment center and said the the treatment team the clinical team prided themselves on being able to to sort of punch the client in the nose if you will with these kinds of confrontations these these diagnostics or or confronted descriptions of the person's behavior that's not therapy it's not good therapy so let's talk about what i say that it comes from the narcissistic wound um if we can simplify the narcissistic wound which is not narcissism narcissism is a diagnostic diagnostic category a threshold right where if your symptomology reaches a, a certain level you you qualify it with enough symptoms or behaviors and you reach the level of narcissism that's not what i'm talking about but all of us have some narcissistic wounds and just like i've talked about already in this broadcast it's a continuum some of us more than others essentially the narcissistic wound is the wound of not being seen and having the experience in childhood that the authentic or real self was not tolerated was not acceptable i cannot tell you how universal that that experience is for children again some have it more or, or less but almost everybody I've ever worked with professionally, and, and I would say even socially, maybe even more so sometimes socially, has, has experienced or, or expressed this, this feeling, this sense that they weren't allowed to feel a certain thing. It might be anger, sadness. And we're, you know, in our families, in our family, we don't give up, we don't quit. So if that part shows up, you don't belong it is the implication. It's not acceptable. I talk about it in, in some of my teaching, the, the, the movie that won the Academy Award for Best Animated Picture a couple of years ago, Inside Out, when the young girl around 12 years old is sat at the dinner table, kind of sulking, and she gets in trouble for it. She just moved, lost all of her friends, uprooted. And when she has some kind of not so happy responses to her parents kind of poking to see what's going on, and she's upset, the father eventually says to her, where did my good little girl, good little girl go? Think about that. Where did my good little girl go? When you're really talking about a young girl who's been uprooted, who's experienced some, some form of trauma, maybe not big T trauma, although it could be argued. And she's being told that she's not good, essentially, because she's not feeling happy. I'm going to read this to all of you. I, I pulled it from a blog that I wrote on my own website called What Really is Narcissism? So I'm, I'm going to read this to you out loud. Um, those of you that are watching on, on the visual, the, the webinar version of the, can, can read along with me. Oftentimes, the, the narcissistic wounding is much, much more subtle than we imagine. Here's what I say. Narcissism is not a result of being overvalued. I think there's a lot of people in our culture that believe that narcissistic or entitled children but which by the way let me just make this really clear narcissism is a natural part of child development children are self-centered by design and sometimes we can perpetuate abuse on, on children when we expect them to be developmentally developmentally more advanced than they are so narcissism is not a result of being overvalued you're not being spoiled not at all. In fact, just the opposite. Instead, narcissism is the result of valuing the wrong thing in the child or, maybe better said, valuing the child in the wrong way. Yes, the child might be indulged, but that's not overvaluing the child. That's the parent not having a, a secure enough self to, to hold boundaries, to let the child suffer and be in pain and then the parent being able to respond empathically and appropriately. So on the surface, if we were just looking at it like non-therapists, on the surface level, we would say, yeah, that, that child's being overvalued or spoiled, is what we would say. But really, it's a lack of connection, which, which has its roots in a lack of self in the parent. An unhealed narcissistic wound in the parent. 
undealt with. To put it another way, I write, the child is not valued. Technically, it might be impossible to overvalue a child, but we can value them for the wrong reasons, such as valuing them for being good or being easy or happy. Many children experience praise and adoration for, for their accomplishments or giftedness and interpret it as love because it gets kind of called that sometimes. It feels like that. Like I said, I, I talked about in the recent Academy Award winning movie, Inside Out, the main character was referred to by her parents as our happy little girl. After several disheartening events in her life, the young girl experienced and displayed sad and morose emotions. Subsequently, due to a lack of empathic capacity, an inability of her parents to hold that, her parents interpreted this as disrespect rather than a valid emotional response given the circumstances. Can you hear the gaslighting in it? I mean, literally, you're watching a, a scenario in a cartoon that happens in virtually every American home it, sometimes. And again, like I wrote in my original post this evening, I think a lot more than most of us would like to admit. When we are valued for things such as our talents, our intelligence, our obedience, or our happiness, essentially, we are not seen by others. Alice Miller, who wrote the drama of The Gifted Child, in my opinion, the most important book on child development in the 20th century. She talked about the need to cut the connection between being admired and being loved. She said, without therapy, it is impossible for the grandiose person or the narcissistic person, it is impossible for the grandiose person to cut the tragic link between admiration and love. When, when children who, who grow up into adults mistake admiration for love, they're always seeking for it. And it looks like and starts to smell like classic narcissism. That, that grandiose disregarding of others, always being right, unable to apologize. And, and by the way, the, the phenomenal thing about responding to a narcissist, your instinct, our instinct to knock them down to size is exactly the opposite of what they need from a therapist and on a therapeutic level. So we have it more than we would like. All of us have some. Don't worry about diagnosing yourself as a narcissist. Just know that you have some of this wounding, right? That's why talented people who receive awards for, for their talents, financial uh, rewards, uh, rewards on, on the Academy Awards, right? All kinds of accolades will tell you often, they'll say it in the public, I feel like a phony. I feel like if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't be okay with it. it, it it's precisely this experience why this narcissistic wounding, it, it's, it's precisely because of our narcissistic wounding that why we sometimes have a difficult time accepting compliments. Because we, we, we think we know this thought. The thought is, if, you, if I really showed up, if you saw all of me, I know you would leave me. I know you wouldn't accept it. And although I might even be trying to get that compliment, trying to get that admiration, the minute that I get it, it feels cheap and it's ill-fitting for me. When I wrote the post that I shared with you earlier, for those of you that might have joined a little bit later, I'll, I'll go to it. Um, I wrote this post um, on all my social media about 10 days ago or so. I said, most parents gaslight their children on a consistent basis. Regretfully, I said, I have done it more than I'd like to admit. And yes, it is a symptom of parental narcissism. And then I went on to say, it is exactly because of this, this childhood experience of, of being gaslit that we become susceptible to it later in life. So if you have found yourself in a relationship where you have been significantly gaslit by somebody displaying what, what looks like maybe even full-blown narcissism, that's usually the complaint. Let me be clear with you. 
You were gaslit as a child. You were told that what you felt was, was not okay, was not right, was crazy, was wrong in some way. So when I wrote this, I got these objections. Let's just be clear, these objections came from a defense, right? People couldn't read the gray in it. My, my language was strong, so because it wasn't therapy, I, I was being a little bit provocative and, and I could understand how it could provoke the defense, you see. One of the, the, the objections was only narcissists do this, full-blown narcissists. We like to create a, what I, what I know about this is we like to create a safe distance, we people. We like to create a safe distance between us and the disturbed, right? The badness must be out there in the other. Melanie Klein talks about this in human development. She says there, there are two positions, right? The, the, she calls it the paranoid position that, that we're born into, we're born with, where, where evil and badness is out there. And then the later stage, she calls the, 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 not everybody gets to, to a large degree, she calls it the, the depressed position. And the depressed position is, is when we start to realize, maybe I have something to do with it. Maybe I'm part of the problem. That's really what this parenting work is for. It's getting you to a, a safe, through a safe process to, to be able to say, I don't care how successful you are in your life. I don't care if you're the CEO of the biggest company in the world. I don't care if you've won Academy Awards, if you have multi-hit albums, if you're the greatest dancer that ever lived, whatever it is. You have some stuff in you, right? You have, you have a horrible rotten self, if you will. And, and it's okay. You don't know it's okay because you weren't taught that it was okay. You were taught that it just wasn't okay. So that was the first defense and, and the misunderstanding of the person who made it. Another thing that somebody says is that, that I was overstating it because it's gaslighting is a conscious manipulation. And I, my response is, I'm not so sure. The narcissist is suffering. Let's be clear. It doesn't look like they're suffering. It feels like we're suffering in their presence. But that's just the projection and what we really call the projective identification, which means they're making us feel how they feel deep down inside. Narcissists are suffering dramatically. They're not at peace. They're dramatically terrified. They can't be wrong. They can't be second place. They can't not know something. They can't be a part of the problem. There's this idea that psychologists will sometimes talk about called pseudo stupidity. When I was defining gaslighting earlier, uh, I was saying that it's not necessarily conscious, but the, the, the person doing it acts as if they don't know they're doing it. And again, this is not a cognitive limitation. It is a psychological impairment. It looks like stupidity, but it's not. These people are bright, intelligent people, but there's a defense at play here. They're unable to see it, unwilling to see it, in denial of it. Somebody said in response to my post, most parents, and the research shows that somewhere between around 56 and 60%, most parents are securely attached. And thus they're able to provide their child with a securely, a securely attached response. I had to think about this one for a little bit because I've seen that research. And then I remembered what research is. I remember that it can say anything and I don't know what that is and what the data is really telling us. And at the end of the day, it's not my experience. I can sit in a restaurant. I can be at a dinner party. I can be at the, the, the pool at the club. I can be with my friends golfing, playing tennis. I can be sitting in the other room, listening to, to, to people talk in virtually every setting that there is. And I hear people doing this. You've heard me tell this joke. It's not a joke, but there's this, 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 use this funny example. I'm a 51 year old man who does not like mushrooms. 
And when I tell people that I don't like mushrooms, it is almost impossible that people will just let it go. Almost always people tell me, have you tried it this way or you can barely taste it? Or if it's a texture thing, texture thing, it's not, you know, you won't feel the texture in, the, in this food. I, I've joked about the fact that sometimes I just tell people I'm allergic to mushrooms. So I don't have to defend not liking mushrooms. And everybody, I'm saying something silly, right? Try it. But everybody on this broadcast, listening to this broadcast, knows exactly what I'm talking about. It is difficult for human beings to allow the other person to be other. It's threatening and scary. So while the research suggests it, I don't really know what that research is saying. And it's just not my experience. And I could prove it in virtually every setting that I've ever been in in my life in a few moments. Just share with somebody some really uncomfortable feelings that you're having and watch how they respond. One of the, the, the individuals was a therapist who responded to my post and said, you're just talking about treatment parents. I thought about this one for a little bit because I thought that, that would be a, uh, a fair idea to propose that I, I am, I don't walk in normal circles. First of all, I, I, I thought what I already said to you in, in the broadcast, which is I see it everywhere. I see it in non-treatment families all the time. That is families that don't have anybody that has ever gone to any kind of residential treatment, maybe even any kind of therapy. But here's what I thought of most. The only people that can do it well, meaning the only people that can contain well, in my experience, are the ones that consistently do it well, are the ones who have been through therapy. I'm going to say that again. In my experience, the vast majority, almost exclusively, but I wouldn't go so far, the vast majority of people that can do what I'm describing well, that is hold space for, listen to, not try to change the other, be empathic and still maintain boundaries. The only people that I've been able to see that do that at, at an artful level are people who have been through treatment either themselves or, or with family members that they love. The other fear that comes up, it wasn't written specifically in response to my post, we're afraid. We're afraid that if we empathize and don't correct, don't correct the, the thinking error, the twisted thinking, if you will, that we're exonerating the, the, the child or the, the spouse, if it's a spouse or a sibling or a parent. It's just not true. This, this idea of holding space needn't compromise boundaries. And that's why if you find yourself getting into recovery for codependency, or really that's just a pop psychology phrase for, for attachment issues, right? Anxious attachment or insecure avoidant attachment. If you find yourself healing and getting into recovery for, for codependency, um, you'll find that you're able to hold more of other people and your boundaries are clearer and more courageous all the time. So our, our, our misunderstanding, because it was modeled for us this way, our misunderstanding that, that, that empathy and understanding and, and holding space for somebody automatically compromises our boundaries. It's just not true. What it is, is we don't have the bandwidth for empathic misery. We just don't. I mean, everybody has varying levels, some more than others, but that's what we're bumping up against. And that's okay. That's just being human. And the key is just to own it. This is all I can do. Here's a couple of comments that people who have had children that have gone through treatment. This is what they, how they responded to the, the post that, that, I, that I put out there. I like this one because I think it, it was the fairest critique, at least the first sentence was the fairest critique of what I said. This person said, you use strong language, but I agree with you. Most parents are, are, uh, operate in an unconscious default mode, repeating the patterns that, that have been in their families for years. It's hard to look back on your own childhood and see why you turned out the way you have. 
and to make sense of your life. It's brave and heroic to make your child an active participant in their own child childhood and to realize that you as, as a parent have tried to mold them into something that you want them to be. Another parent said, I recently saw a therapist who managed to pack nearly all of those. She was referring to the dismissing comments that I had on the earlier slide. I recently saw a therapist who managed to pack nearly all of those dismissing statements into three sessions, which by the way, is not uncommon. That it took me three sessions to decide not to return, that I questioned my perception, that it was all kinds of wrong is a function of my upbringing. Absolutely. But how does a neuropsychologist, this person asks, with a PhD get away with such behavior? Because a lot of people just don't know it. Professors don't teach it because professors, by and large, don't do their own work. They're, they're teaching it from an from a academic side, not from the side of having sat in a therapy session for 10, 20 years. That, that's what they should have to do to be able to teach it. Say, let me, I want to share with you. Wouldn't it be great if a professor said to their students who were studying psychotherapy, I sat in therapy for the last 15 years or 10 years or 20 years, and I'm going to share with you the mechanism that creates healing and sustainable change. How wonderful would that be? But instead, it's all numbers and data and, 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 and empirical research studies that are at arm's length from the, human, from the humanity of this work. Some other responses from parents who have had treatment experience. Somebody said, I'm curious, do you have any examples? That's why I provided the sheet. So they were curious. Someone said, thank you for the language. That's really helpful. I like the concrete stuff. Someone said, thanks for owning it. It makes it easier for me to own it. Another said, I find that most parents in my social and professional life struggle with secure attachment. Unfortunately, I find securely attached parents are in the minority. Again, once you have the lens, you hear it all over the place. You hear it in yourself. That's why the more work you do, the more you realize you're kind of just bumbling through this and doing the best you can. And the best thing you can do is make an amends to your child on a, on a consistent basis. And then, of course, the most common response was me too. And then I thought about this cartoon that, that's in my book from Savage Ticken, Chickens, the Savage Chickens uh, series. Doug Savage is the, the author of, of the cartoon. And this particular cartoon, he calls the three stages of self-awareness. And in scene one, the one chicken is saying to the other chicken, you're an idiot. And the second chicken is saying no. In screen two, the first chicken is saying you're an idiot and the second chicken is saying yes. And then the final screen, the second ch chicken is just saying I'm an idiot. You're free. When you know that you're an idiot, and I don't mean it in a pejorative sense, the, the, it's the opposite. This is, this is a courageous, strength-based not knowing, right? It's what the philosophers talk about. About the more you learn, the more you learn what you don't know. It's that kind of thing. It's what the Buddhists call having a beginner's mind, being curious. It's what I talk about when I say the master therapist is the one who prides themselves on not knowing the answer. There's a more complex version of this. I've shared this, this poster. There, there was this poster that was behind uh, my therapist for years, five, six, seven years. Um, it was entitled The Words of Higher Enlightenment. It's, it's subtle when you, when you see it. The words just kind of blend together. And then she had these list of words with this artwork. And the list of words on this Words of Higher Enlightenment image were these, drop out, fail, quit, lose, relax, give in, flunk, let go, empty, surrender, wait, give over, mellow out, slow down, forget, submit, forego, escape, drop the ball, wash out, miss, stumble, lay an egg, crap out, so forth and so on. So I would, med I would meditate on this poster at the, at the beginning of sessions and during sessions sometimes over and over again. And, and she's trying to, to teach me 
that, that enlightenment or the moments of enlightenment are when we're able to see all of us, all of ourselves, not just the talents and the strengths, which we all have, which you all have, which your children all have, but we're able to see the other parts of ourselves. And the ability to see those parts of ourselves comes as we do our work and develop more and more compassion. I was talking with a colleague just this week, and we were talking about the the, the idea of inner child work of, of seeing your, 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 the, the, the young child inside of you. And my friend was saying, you know, there's a scared, insecure child that I can see inside of me. And I, and I know when he shows up and I said, yeah, tell me about that. And he described the behavior when the scared child shows up in a, in a conversation or situation. And I said, that's great. I said, it's important that you're kind to the child. He was asking the question, what, what do you do? And I said, you're, you, it's important to be kind to the child. Treat the, the, that, that aspect of yourself. Treat it with patience. Tell it that you're listening. Hold it, if you would, metaphorically, as you would hold a little child. And be careful not to be impatient with it or to insult it. Be careful not to, to, to kind of be stern with it and tell it, tell it that, that part of you, you need to get over it. You need to stop showing up. It's not like it was when we were young. Because when you do that, it, it's likely going to lead to denial, to go underground, to go underground and, and to crop up somewhere else in your life. So we learn to hold the wounds, our, our woundedness, with patience and compassion. And that takes difficulty because that's not what we were shown. Our wounds were unacceptable. They were a threat. They led to dangerous symptoms. They lead to dangerous, dangerous symptoms in your children. Absolutely, right? Drug abuse, cutting, suicidality, right? Fighting, yelling, right? Avoidance, all of those things that, that you've sent your children to our program for. So it's counterintuitive. But, but I say this to clients all the time at any age, including the parents. Let's just try love and see how that works. I know it seems like because these things scare us and hurt us, that we need to control them. That, that's our instinct, right? I was describing it to somebody today. If you were about to get into a fender bender and noticed it, your instinct in that moment would be the opposite of what would be best for you. The reason why drunk drivers sometimes are the least injured is because they're the most relaxed. But what happens when you're about to ram into somebody's bumper? You tense up. That's the instinct. It's a protective instinct. And at very, very low speeds, it's going to be helpful. But what happens when we tense up? Bones are broken. So when we get scared emotionally, psychologically, when our children are, are spiraling, as, as your children have, you hold on tighter. This way of being, this way of thinking, this way of responding to the wound is different. It is with curiosity and patience while still maintaining a limit and a boundary that you need for you. So what are the take homes? I've covered them, I think, but I'll review them. Become aware. Sigmund Freud taught that the purpose of therapy was freedom, right? Freedom from our unconscious conflicts, our unconscious obligations, freedom to choose. And it's not, a one-time light bulb situation, it takes practice. And help from a therapist who can be as patient with you as I'm describing so you can learn it for the first time. It's okay to own your wounds when, when you act them out. It's okay. I mean, that's the, that's the paradigm shift between therapy and most of the rest of our lives is in a truly therapeutic context your wounds and your symptoms aren't bad they're just wounds and symptoms that's it and then yes they hurt you and others and that's what they do they hurt you and others but the words bad and wrong are words that were, were laid over to control people to guilt them to give them a sense of, of obligation it makes sense. And in small doses, 
perhaps it might not have been that harmful, but in the, in the amount that we get in our lives, the side effects are toxic and damaging. And then if we're lucky enough to stumble into a mentor, a wonderfully compassionate and patient person's life, maybe it's a, a grandparent, maybe it's a parent who has the capacity or has developed the capacity, maybe it's a therapist. If we walk into there and somebody responds to us differently and says, it's okay, I've done worse. I'm, you know, join the idiot club. That's the magic of AA, right? Of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the fellowship. As you walk in there with all that shame about all the lies, all the, all the betrayals, all the hurt that you've caused the people that love you the most, and you sit down and you, you, you summon the courage to tell part of your story, and the group just looks at you and says, we're glad you're here. You're in the right place. And that is everything. That's everything. And in that kind of psychological grace, shame cannot survive. And, and when shame goes away, you start to heal and integrate. You start to be, a, as, as Carl Jung says, a whole person instead of a good person. But we have so little experience. We were taught this, this universal lie. We were taught it by our, our grandparents, by our parents, by our brothers, by our sisters, by our, our teachers and friends. We were taught this grand lie. It's the same lie that we, that we tell when we say that good babies, that good babies, newborn babies are good where well, they don't cry very much or they don't fuss a lot it's the same lie that adam and eve were told when the serpent whispered in their ear cover yourselves up and hide from god the the, the lie is shame the lie is that who you are is not okay and people do it because they think that's the way to help they think that's how to keep people inside of a safe place that's what it is it's just fear Nothing more strange than fear. It's just fear. But this work and, and what your children's behavior, symptoms, what their diagnoses, what their issues are doing is they're cracking you and the rest of the family wide open so this, this light can get in. This awareness can get in. And it's, there's nothing better, right? It's, it's everything. And it takes... I want to say this. It takes a long time, you guys. It takes a long time. You get a glimpse, and that's enough to keep going. But it takes years. I, I said to my therapist just last Friday, I said, I wish there was a shortcut sometime. I really do. I wish there was a way to, 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 to help people see this, this magical place of, of healing. And she agreed and she said, smile, we talk about this now and again. She said, wouldn't it be great? And unfortunately, all we can do is just be there for them along the way. And let them know that it took us years to find it also. It's important as a parent that you are able to carry around your horrible, rotten self. That means you're, you're, you're all of you, your mistakes, your buffoonery, your idiocy your limitations, your temper, right? Your, your, your fear, all of it. That you can carry it around so that your child doesn't have to carry it because they will. Or they'll feel absolutely terrifically horrible that they're not. And what will they do? They'll medicate themselves to deal with that, that, that guilt, that pain of not being able to do it for you. It's important to understand that mental illness and, and mental health is a continuum. Narcissism is a continuum. Gaslighting is a continuum. I mean, one of the, the signs of mental health is to learn to see more and more gray. Um, borderline personality disorder or borderline functioning, which is more temporary, is the, the epitome of black and white, us versus them, all or nothing. You're for me or you're against me. There are, there's only two piles. You're a hero, you're a villain. You're an angel, you're a devil. 
right? That's borderline personality or borderline functioning. And when we start to move away from borderline functioning, because all of us can slip into that in moments of stress or pain or fear. If you were tortured, you would start to think in, in, in borderline ways, extreme, irrational, psychotic ways, and the gray would disappear and everything would become black or, or white. I think art is, is trying to do that for us, but therapy and psychological health, development and well-being is learning to see the gray. In dialectical behavioral therapy, they call it starting to see that two seemingly opposite things can both be true. And the, the, the most popular one that I love that I shared in my first book is at, at any given moment, you're doing the best you can and you can do better. Both are true at every given moment. So continuums in gray are a sign of mental health. Really what we're treating is guilt and shame in everybody and you and me. That's what we're treating. Right? The cover-ups, the, the armor, they, they take on different forms and they develop tenets and, and specificities, but we're treating guilt and shame. And our parents and my therapists that I deal with, heck, I was treating it on, on, on Instagram last week when I was getting this, these responses from people, <clears throat> or at least I wasn't treating it, but I was responding to it. I had raised the defense in people. Boundaries do not need, they don't need to be compromised with an increase in empathy, right? That's the mistake that we make, is we think it's one or the other. And really, healthy development is both. Um, as you do this work, and some of you are farther along, some of you are newer, newer, the gift that you give to your children is your strength. You say, I'm sorry, not from a guilty, neurotic, fearful place, but you say, I'm sorry, because you've developed enough strength and worked through enough guilt and shame that you say, yeah, I'm part of it. I'm part of the dance. I, I, I say, take 100% responsibility for 2% of the problem. The opposite is when we blame and point out that we're only responding rationally to, a, to an irrational situation and that the cycle didn't start with us. So I hope that was interesting to you or, or um, gave you some ideas and tools. I'm going to go through our upcoming slides and then I'll take any live questions. Parent workshops coming up. If you probably haven't signed up for the December 7th or 8th, you're probably not going to, but you would be welcome to. Uh, December 7th and 8th in, in Cascades in our Oregon program. In January 25th and 26th, that'll be in our Utah program. In February, it'll be our Cascades program. We would like all current families to go to a workshop if possible. You can combine these with a visit to see your child if your therapist says that the timing is a good fit clinically. We have no more parent support groups for the rest of 2019. So we'll, we'll announce our schedule for 2020 here in the next couple of weeks. If you want to stay on the list for parent support groups, any of you, anybody listening to the podcast, watching the webinar, sometimes with, with, our, with our email, mass mailer, people just get kicked off and we, we don't control that or we don't know when it happens. If you want to get on the list for parent support groups in your area or, or region, please contact Melanie at evoketherapy.com to, to be on that list. Okay. If you want to do a deep dive, this work, what I'm, that I'm describing tonight, to be able to see the, the subtleties that we're talking about, that I'm talking about tonight, the nuances. If you want to do a deep dive and understand your own narcissistic wound, because every parent has some, some more than others, then I would encourage you to attend an intensive. It's, I think, besides sending your child to the program, it is the best thing that you can do for your child, let alone for you. It's the best thing that you can do for your child. So the next opening will be in January, January 8th through 12th. It's filling up a little bit. So if you're interested, please email intensives at evoketherapy.com. Couples, families, and professional intensives are available. Um, contact intensives at evoketherapy. Look at our website for more information. Our pursuits trips are our adventure therapy trips. 
for young adults or families think therapy light or sober fun kind of a but a fun kind of reconnection anywhere from a three-day trip to a 30-day trip customized we ask all current parents to go to six 12 step support groups um so any combination of alan on coda or families anonymous go to their websites alanon.org coda.org or familiesanonymous.org to find meetings in your area. You can also go to adultchildren.org if you can identify or see where maybe some of the things that happened in your family weren't quite right growing up. Adult children is a great resource. And again, um, people think it's just for children of alcoholics because that's the title, Adult Children of Alcoholics, ACOA. But you start to see things like I'm describing tonight, like maybe I didn't have, have raging alcoholic parents, but wow, wasn't as great as I thought wasn't as harmless as I thought. Alateen is for teens. RefugeRecovery.org is a place you can go to to hear about support groups, refuge recovery support groups for um, Buddhist-inspired, less of a higher power emphasis, if that's a barrier for you. The National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI.org, you can go to and find chapters in your local area, resources in your local area that are free. On social media, follow us, listen to the podcast app, share the podcast app, we want to proliferate the, the message out there. This is a free resource for everybody, for the public. On an iPhone or an iOS device, go to the SoundCloud, excuse me, go to the podcast app. Use the podcast app. All iPhones have them. On an Android device, use the SoundCloud app. Or on your computer, go to soundcloud.com. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram using the, the hashtag, or excuse me, the, the, the handle at Evoke Therapy, the Summit Lodge or Intensive Program. You can find on Instagram using Adivoke Summit Lodge. On Facebook, you can find us by searching Adivoke Therapy Programs. The Alumni Foundation on Facebook by searching Evoke Family Foundation. That's an organization of, of alumni parents that uh, help raise money for people that can afford therapy. And I believe they're gonna be closing their spots. They're looking for a, a couple of board members. So that'll be closing soon. If you wanna give back, if you have some experience in fun, fundraising and you wanna give back in that way, go to the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook and contact them there. The Evoke Therapy blog, just two new blogs came out this week, updated information all week. My first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is available on Amazon. Also, you can get an Audible copy through Audible. And then if you use the Parent Alumni Foundation book page through the Amazon Smiles program, a percentage of the proceeds goes toward people who can't afford therapy through the, through the foundation. All right, some comments and questions from people. And two, I'm two years out with my son and he is much worse. I'm still worried about the path he is on. He is defiant and stating that his father and I ruined his life when we sent him away. Everyone tells me that I have let him, that I have to let him hit rock bottom. And so to do what, so I wanna do that. Any advice? Go to Al-Anon. First of all, I wouldn't give you that advice. I, nobody ought to give you any advice when it comes to the care of your son. The advice I give you is to heal and be aware of your own codependency, your own anxiety, and to get your, your fear, which is real, your pain, which is real, sorted out there so that when you show up in relationship to your son, it's for his support, okay? So just, I, I can't, Say it emphatically enough. Go to an Al-Anon meeting. Go to a codependency meeting. Listen to other people who have had chronic alcoholics, addicts, mentally ill people that they love in their lives and see how they've learned to cope with it and see how they've learned to find their own serenity. It's critical. It's a great question you ask. Sorry you're going through it, but that's what I would do. Another person writes, I agree that this program was best for my child. He graduated from high school and now it's just, uh, is now, but now is just on a constant daily high. This is the same person. He doesn't live with me, but he lives with his father. He's about to kick him out. Same answer. Can you talk more about the words of enlightenment more? I'm currently in a situation where I want to step back from responsibilities and every single one of those words is both enticing and terrifying to me. Um, yes, that's what it is. It's, um, you know, it's what I talk about all the time. To, to, to find serenity, to find healthy self-care, you're going to have to do battle with fear and guilt, right? The thing that prevents us from 
figuring ourselves out, from finding our, our, our authentic self, our real self, the thing that gets in the way of it, is fear and guilt, right? It, it's, I, I'm not being silly when I say this, but it is what George Lucas was trying to identify when he talked about the dark side versus the light side. One is about control. Fear turns to anger. Anger, anger turns to the dark side, right? Control. And one is about surrender, letting go. Stop trying to control things that you can't. So find places, find a person, find a group where you can, it's safe to explore you. You don't trigger a, a loved one's anxiety to try to get you back, back inside the, the, the plan, right? Try that. It's, it's a, you're, you're, the, what you're expressing tells me that you're on the path. You're absolutely on the path. Another parent says, our son takes the odor shame and blames everything on us. That's what people do. In this way of thinking, when you embrace being wrong, it slides right off your back. Right? It goes right through you. So when, if, you're, if your son or daughter says, you're the root of all my problems, your response is, sorry. I know I've done a lot of mistakes. I'm just really sorry. I'm glad you're telling me. And then go get support. Go get somebody who can support you because he can't. And the more you can do that, live that process, it only, it only does it because it works for the system. It works for, it's the dance, if you will. And I get triggered in the same way. I slip up in the same way. But the longer I do my work, the more I allow my children to not like me, think I'm an idiot, and the less that they do it because it's okay. I don't need them not to think that. I'm okay with them thinking that. And it doesn't have virtually little to no effect on my boundaries, right? But dad can be an idiot. That's the, that's the shift in this work. The shift is, and it goes back to the words of higher enlightenment, the shift is from being right to being a person. In this work, in psychological healing, growth, enlightenment, you don't get to be right anymore. But you get to be a self. And it is so much better. So much better. I was talking to another colleague this week. Saying, once you accepted the fact that you're the bad, horrible person, you're free. And what comes out of it is love. Because the acceptance isn't a painful shaming experience. It's like, yeah, I'm kind of a buffoon. If you listen to the Dalai Lama, that's how he talks. If you listen to the Dalai Lama, which I have, his speeches are peppered with humorous, light acknowledgments of what an idiot he is. Right? It doesn't compromise his, his sense of self. He's not saying in a in a self-deprecating, self-flagellating way. He's just saying, I'm just a human. When I saw him, he almost tripped on his way off the stage and he laughed and laughed and laughed at himself. He said, wouldn't that have been a perfect ending when you can laugh at yourself, right? Think about those people that we know that can't laugh at themselves. When you can laugh at yourself, truly laugh at yourself, you're free. You're free. Well, thank you for joining. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting um, for you. Um, I love doing these for myself. The next one I'll be doing is what I'm call, call, calling the season of gifts. The difference between giving and getting, loving and needing in our relationships. And I, I don't think we realize. I think there's a lot of times in our lives when we think that we're loving and giving, we're actually taking. So I think that's important, important to understand. And that's what our, our loved ones experience. We say we're loving, but we're actually asking something from them. Oftentimes it's emotional containment. So that'll be this Monday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Monday, December 9th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. The season of gifts, giving and getting, loving and needing. Again, thank you for joining me tonight on the live broadcast and for those of you listening to the podcast, I hope it's helpful. 
thank you for it on behalf of your entire family, everybody who knows you, for you being willing to look at this work and to take a, the courageous step to consider your participation in all of this. It is a great, great gift that comes from strength. Take care, folks. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.